Hello, Fotopilla, Rafael, the bar here. Welcome to the show. Welcome to another masterclass. Today, we'll learn how to create dynamic landscape and cityscapes with Pref Professor Hines, uh, Kenneth Hines. Kenneth, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited because it's very rare that I actually get to talk about something that's not street photography. I know most people, they know me as a street photographer, but I'm originally a landscape photographer. Imagine that. Um, I've been landscape for about 12, 13 years, um, even though many people may not see that often, but I'm excited to actually go about showing some of my cityscapes and landscapes. And I think for the most part, every last image here is brand new. I've never really shown any of these images, especially from some of my recent travels. Um, so yeah. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a Zeiss ambassador, Haida ambassador, Saray, Google. Um, you all may remember if you're a Lightroom user, if you utilize Lightroom um, for the before the previous update, I was the splash screen cover artist for that. So if you use Lightroom, you may have seen my image displayed on Lightroom. And if you attended Adobe Max, then you might have seen my presentation on color adjustments. So mm -hmm. some of the images that you see, if you have questions about my color adjustments, you know, check out Adobe Max. And that way you can see actual tutorials of how I go through with the editing there. Nice, nice. And today, what, what are we going to see? What are we going to learn? All right. So because I know because I know that a lot of people are super excited for this class today. It's a different class. And you're uh, strong in what you do. So what are we going to learn? So I'm going to share my screen here. And we're going to open up our presentation. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're doing. Hopefully everyone can see this. Yeah, perfect. And um, creating dynamic landscapes and cityscapes. So I'm, I'm going to talk about, you know, show some of the images that I know people have had questions about where they're like, how in the world did you take that? Or how did you edit that? So I, I tried to make sure that I selected some of my, my community favorites and, and images that are my favorite that I wanted to, to sort of talk about. And then also talk about why in the world did I decide to travel as much as I did during a pandemic? That's, that's gonna be a little fun. <laughs> um, so first things first, what gear do I utilize? I know that's always the question, so let's get that out of the way. <laughs> okay. um, now, that you, uh, can, now that you mentioned questions, guys, if you have questions, just leave uh, the questions in the comment, in the comments, and uh, Sandra will be collecting us for us, so we'll be, ask, uh, okay, we'll, we'll be answering all your questions, so sorry for the interruption. Oh, no problem. You. So if you see a good question, by all means, you know, stop me, and I definitely would love to, to awesome. answer it right then. So what gear do I utilize? Well, my gear has really been changing quite a bit over the last year, year and a half. Um, the pandemic sort of made me take time to really think about what I was doing and what I wanted to do, what kind of gear would sort of match what I wanted to do. So I've gone through some changes, but I decided, you know, let me sort of put everything together of what I have been using since the start of the pandemic to make it easier on life. So my cameras, um, I was formerly a Sony ambassador, so I'm still shooting Sony. Um, I'm loving the Sony A1. This has been my favorite camera since it's come out earlier this year. I use this camera for all of my, my cityscapes, all of my landscapes, like all of the images that you see behind me, even though I think only one image behind me was taken with the A1 just because it's so, such a newer camera. Um, I, I love this because it's it's like my Sony A9, but on steroids. So I get the speed of the nine, you know, I get the controls because I, I really love this extra mode dial on the top of the one. Uh, and, and that's something that I really loved about the A9 because it just takes certain functions away from the menu to where I can adjust quickly, you know, change from manual focus to autofocus and change my drive mode. I don't have to go in camera uh, to in the mute menu system to do that like I did on the, the R3. So really love this camera. My second camera is the A9. And I must mention, 
right now at the time of this recording, I only have one A1 body. But in the coming months, I will have two because it's such a good camera. Such a good camera that I need to have two. Shooting prime lenses, I want to have two bodies so that way when I'm out on location, I can just have one body for this lens, have another, another body with another lens. I don't have to change my lenses in the elements if I don't want to. So then I have the Alpha 9, which has every now and then, you know, I may say, well, let's just shoot with the 9. I don't, it's, a lot of people don't like it just because it's 24 megapixels. But this image behind me, which is this one here of the, the vessel in New York City, that's a 24 megapixel image, but it's a 20, no, I'm sorry, that's a 40 by 60 image. So you can print very large from 24 megapixels. I've had an image that Zeiss blew up for Imaging USA that was 11 feet tall, 24 megapixels. So just because it's 24 megapixels, don't think that you can't, you know, blow up images as large as these. You, you really can. Uh, so large megapixels, not always necessary, but they're good to have. Let's point that out. And then finally, the Sony Alpha 7R 3 Now, I no longer um, own this camera, but a lot of the images that I have um, in this presentation are actually shot with this because this was the camera that I had throughout the, the pandemic uh, because the A1, of course, was not uh, in existence at the time. So a lot of the images were shot with the R3. Now, the one thing that I didn't like with the R3 is that the focusing wasn't as strong as my other cameras. So typically, it was assigned to manual lenses. Uh, for the, the later part of its life that I had it. And so because I was doing cityscape or landscape work anyways, it was okay being that it was a manual use camera and I didn't have to rely on autofocus. Okay, so manual lenses. Zeiss Loxia 21 2.8. This is, you'll probably see that a lot of the images in this, I've shot with this lens. It's, it's such a compact lens, you know, like here's, here's what the lens looks like. Look at how compact this is. It's such a compact lens. And, you know, I can just toss this in my bag and, and keep it moving. You know, it's, it's not a lot of weight. It's a very light lens. And it's, it's one of my, my most used lenses for my cityscape landscape work. Next is the Loxia 35 F2. Um, I use this probably in, in as much as I do the 21. 21 still gets a little edge, but these two, you can always rest assured I'm going to have these in my bag uh, for a lot of what I'm doing. And then the Loxia 50 F2. These are just such compact lenses that they're easy to, to you know travel with, especially they're light. That was one thing that got me to going from Sony A mount to E mount many years ago is because I, I wanted the, the, the lighter uh, weight for my back. And, you know, having that lighter gear, especially when you're hiking, that's very, very important, very important. So here's some examples of what I capture with those lenses, with the 21, the 35, and the 50. Now, um, this first image was taken recently in Hawaii. This middle image was taken um, I was in California at the time. This was the start of my big road trip uh, during the pandemic. And the one time where I had a little mishap. So this image was actually supposed to be taken with a 21. I didn't know that. I, I don't know how I sort of not, didn't realize that I was shooting with the wrong lens, but the 35 worked. So I didn't complain about it. And then the last one is with the 50. And this was taken back in, I, this was actually just last month, I believe, in Pennsylvania. So I did sort of like a little fall mini road trip up in upstate New York and Pennsylvania. And so that gives you some ideas of what I use those lenses for. So then the autofocusing side, I have the Vario Tessar, uh, Sony Zeiss F4, 16-35. Now, a lot of people have asked, you know, why this lens and not the Sony G Master. For one, I'm a Zeiss ambassador. That's mm -hmm. first and foremost. But I, even before then, I still chose this lens because if you're doing cityscapes and landscapes, it doesn't matter if you have a slow lens, you know, I'm not really benefiting off the, the fast aperture. So that wasn't much of a concern. Plus the F4 is a much lighter lens. Again, weight is more important to me. 
as much as, as well as the quality of the lens and Zeiss optics are quality lenses. So I don't have a problem using an F4 lens. Um, then I have the Zeiss bodice of 25 millimeter F2. And then also the um, Sony Zeiss Sonar 1.855 lens. Now this, the 55, I, I refuse to ever let this lens go. This was my first lens that I bought when I switched over to the E-mount about five, five or so years ago, five, six years ago. And I refuse to let it go. It's my oldest lens, but it is my most favorite lens to this day. Like I still feel this is one of the best lenses that ever came out for the Sony E-mount. It's just such a phenomenal lens. And so these are some of the examples that I've captured with those lenses, uh, with the 16 to 35, the, the 25, and then the 55. So the first image, Miami, second image is uh, Battery Park in New York. And then the 55 image is in Washington State. This was earlier this year in June, I believe. And then here's some additional lenses that I might not take all the time, but I do use them here and there for certain images as well. And that's the Sony 12 to 24 F4, the G lens. And I'll come back to that in a second because I'm sure some people are probably like, wait a minute, huh? The Zeiss Loxia 85 2.4 and then the Zeiss Bodice 85 1.8. So why in the world do I have two 85s? Because I like the Loxias for manual focus. It, it's different than using an autofocus lens in manual because the, the autofocus lenses are focused by wire. So you, you don't know where the focus really is on a focus by wire lens when you switch it into manual focus. However, on the Zeiss bodice lenses, you have an LCD that actually gives you that, that information as far as where the actual focusing distance is set to. A lot of the other lenses don't have that capability. So in doing landscapes, that's very important to actually have those markings, know where my focus is set. And having that detached and, and having mechanical manual lenses is more important to me. So that's why I have dedicated manual lenses. And again, I don't mind my lenses being slower. So the 2.4 doesn't bother me. And it's a very, very good compact lens. Now let's come back to that G lens. The Zeiss Ambassador, yes. But this is one of the little sort of hitches that I get to use a Sony lens. So this is a lens that we don't have in our lineup. We don't have a lens that's a 12 millimeter that's that wide of a lens. The widest native that we have is an 18 bodice. If we go on the Sony side, there is a 16 to 35 F4, which I do have. But there are some shots that I specifically need a 12. So in order to do that, I had to have a 12 millimeter lens. So that's the only time where you'll see this lens utilized. Um, I try not to really rely on it that much. It's, it's very, very specific. So I ultimately have a lens that I specifically use between 12 and 15 because that's a range that we don't have natively on the Zeiss lenses. Hopefully one day, but not today, not today. And then these are some of the examples. So like this first image, that's an image I could never get unless I had a 12 millimeter. So that's why I have that lens. The Loxy 85 2.4, you know, it's very good for when you have enough distance and you can capture, you know, it's still capturing a full waterfall there, but I had that distance. And so that's how I knew the Loxy 85 would be good in this composition, which is a waterfall um, in upstate New York. And then the, the Bodice 85 um, is an image from Oahu, Hawaii. And, you know, again, you know, if you have that distance, sometimes you can just create really great compositions that you might not be focused on the full scene of something. You might just narrow it down and want a tighter lens. So, hey, Kenneth, Kenneth, there is a question on the lenses. Uh, in yes. Line. I'm going to try this the first time and see what happens. Well, here we have it. <laughs> Mark Walker, why do you need both the 55 millimeters and the 50 millimeter, millimeter lens? Why would you choose to use one over the other? That's a good question. And then see, this is why I like being interrupted because I forgot to mention something. <laughs> who, who, who asked that question? You actually just helped me out a lot. Yeah. So Mark Walker. <laughs> why do I have two? That's a great question. 
So the Zeiss Loxia lenses are not weather sealed lenses. They do have a weather sealed gasket on the rear of the lens, which if you look here, it's this blue rear element here, this blue ring that you see. So it has a water sealed gasket on the rear, but the lens itself is not a weather sealed lens. The 55, however, is a weather sealed lens. Mm -hmm. So that's where the difference will be. My primary lenses are the Loxias. But if there are encounters that I have where, say, there's I'm going someplace and there's inclement weather the entire time, like it's it's raining constantly, then I have to assign the bodice lenses or any of the autofocus lenses, like the 55 or the 16 to 35, because those are weather sealed lenses. If I know where I'm going doesn't have um, a lot of inclement weather, or it may just be a little bit of rain. The Loxia lenses can take a little bit of rain, but they're not to the extent of, of what I have with the, the bodice lenses that are fully weather sealed lenses that, that can actually withstand, you know, really harsh inclement weather. So that's, that's why I have the, the multiple lenses. So that, that was a very good question to, to point out because I totally forgot about that. <laughs> cool, thank you. So as, as much as I can, I will try to, to, to keep the, the Loxias in service, but if, if you know, weather, doesn't allow me to do so, then I'll assign the autofocus lenses, which are all the weather sealed lenses. So additional gear, I use my, so I have my trusty tripod here, which is right next to me, which is the Saray ST125 tripod. Uh, this is my, my uh, newest tripod. I've been using this since about April of this year. It's a carbon fiber tripod, super light, super light. Like I actually have to clean it now, but I mean, this thing has been a champ because I've had this in salt water for an entire week. And it's it's just been a, a great lens that I've taken all over um, in just such a short period of time. So having a good tripod is very essential. You want something sturdy and um, you want something really dependable. And then what I also like is that on the bottom of this, if you twist, it has the uh, the spikes in here. So I love that I don't have to, you know, change out the, the feet of the tripod. You know, the spikes are there, just twisted, and there they are. So very, very good uh, quality, sturdy carbon fiber tripod there. Next, I use a JJC intervalometer. And um, unfortunately, the one that I have here, it doesn't work anymore. Why does it not work anymore? Because I was in Hawaii recently, last week. And um, I was not watching what I was doing. And it's like I found the one spot on this little rock ridge where there was a puddle. What was in that puddle? Salt water. You kind of know where I'm going with this. It's dead. It doesn't work. But it worked long enough for me to get some of the best shots that I did. So this, this remote was a champion <laughs> until it bit the dust. But this is what I use for triggering my, my shutter when um, I'm doing long exposures. Um, sometimes I do it just, just even if I'm not going in the bulb mode where I have to go beyond the 30 seconds on a Sony camera. Um, I do it that way. I can time uh, of, of pressing the shutter release for when the water is starting to cascade over rock. So that way I get it at the very moment that you sort of see this sort of silky look coming off of the rocks. And I'll show you some examples later on of, of what I'm talking about. And then finally, I use a uh, assortment of filters. Um, right now, I'm actually using the Haida magnetic filters. I have a circular polarizer, a six stop ND, and a 10 stop ND. And before I was using breakthrough filters, which I really did enjoy quite a bit, uh, but Haida actually sent me the, these filters, and I'm, I'm usually a very strict person on what I use for certain equipment. And so I, I love the breakthrough filters tremendously, but I wanted to see, okay, let's see how these Haida filters are, because for me, I have strict requirements for filters. Well, when I use the system, you know, the ones that I had before were just the screw on. Some people ask, why is it that I don't use the, the square filters? That's because I have to have a, a, a bracket system and all this. It's, it's more equipment that I, I don't really want to have. So what I do 
is I have filters that are bigger than the actual lens that they're being applied on. So if you can see in this example here, it's on a Loxia lens, which is I think a 52 millimeter thread, yes. But that's a 77. The reason I do that is because it allows me to where if I obtain any lenses that may be larger than what the lenses that I have in my lineup are at that current time and moment, I can still grow with the same filters. I don't have to worry about replacing them. You just get step, step down rings and it works perfectly fine. So I don't, I don't, you know, have the issue with vignetting or anything just because I don't use that specific diameter of filters. So they sent me this, this magnetic filter system and it was just so much easier. You know, I can just plop my filters on there. Don't have to screw anything on, you, you know, you just screw the adapter and that's it. You know, I just, and then you can stack them. So they, you know, can magnetically stack the filters. The quality didn't change either. And that was something that I, I you know, I didn't want to have where, was there a degradation in sharpness? There was not. Was there any kind of color shift that was noticeable? There wasn't. So I said, hmm, it's an easier system. I think I can go with this. So I inevitably decided to switch entirely to Hida filters and I love them, love them. So if you haven't checked out or if you haven't used a magnetic system at all, but these filters specifically, try them out because I, I love them. I, I literally swear by them now. I didn't ever think I would switch uh, filter companies, but I did. And um, they work well. So any questions after that? Not, okay. not at the moment. So how do I choose where to travel? Well, that's a very good question. So some of the tools that I use is, oh, look at that, photo bills. Oh, yeah. Seems very familiar. Hmm. <laughs> I've heard about this company before. They're really good. So I use photo pills, some of the books that I have, like National Geographic and Google Maps. So photo pills is important because anywhere that I go, I need to know exactly where the sun will rise and where it will set. So that way I don't have to worry about you know, going to a location and that not being the ideal location for where I'm trying to go. And then I can even, you know, change this in the app of, of you know, advancing the time. You know, if I want a specific date, like, oh, I know I'm going here in a month. Let me see where the the, the sun is, where the, the going to be in the morning, in the evening, you know, things of where's the moon going to be. I can see all of that in advance and map my locations based off of those that information. So that's very helpful. Another place where it's also helpful is when I was doing the road trips last year is trying to find where the Milky Way is. Using the 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 AR system and photo pills, I can just take my phone and ah, there's there's the Milky Way. So like it would actually help my business partner and I uh, figure out where we needed to be to get the compositions that we we needed for a particular location. For instance, we we had a, a scenario at Horseshoe Bend in Arizona, and we needed to see where the Milky Way was going to be. Well, when we pulled out the phone and pulled out the app, we saw where it was going to be. We couldn't get the shot, so we didn't have to you know worry about lingering and and waiting till nightfall or anything. We already knew beforehand. Oh, we don't have to stay here. We can go someplace else. So it, it's, you know, that's just one of the, the many ways of how this app works. It's, I mean, it does so much more, but that's that's how I utilize that for, for my travel. And then I use the, the National Geographic books. Um, that's how on the road trips that I do, because we're traveling. I have three books. I go through searching the national parks, state parks, and some of the scenic byways. And they're very helpful for at least giving me certain locations to look at. And then later on, I use Google Maps to pinpoint those to where I create lists. I save them in, in various lists. And then I can, you know, pull up the map on Google Maps and see where those pins are that I've saved. And then I can even add little notes to them. You know, say if there's something specific about that location, I can actually add notes within 
Google Maps for those individual locations or, you know, whatever kind of information I want to have to, to, to um, you know, help me remember something. So it's, it's very, very useful, very useful. And the reason why I, I love Google Maps also is because I've actually have added places to Google Maps that weren't there before. There are some places that are not listed. So you can actually be someone that supports the Maps app for Google by adding new locations. Of course, they go through the verification and all, but once you verify, you have now added to Google Maps. So it just makes it easier to have where people can then later on find places that they might have not known about. So very great tools to utilize for doing cityscapes and landscapes. So next, points to remember. Have anticipation, you know, really anticipate the shots before they actually happen. You know, you kind of have to, it's kind of like being a, a meteorologist. It's like, okay, you're predicting how things are going to be. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But you have to kind of read how the weather is going. You know, I, I focus on that a lot. I look at cloud patterns and sometimes I'm, I, I will say I have about a 99% accuracy of, oh, it's going to be an amazing sunset. I need to go out and I need to, to get to this location. So that's, that's kind of very helpful for, for someone to have. Know your equipment. You don't want to be out fundling with settings. You want to know what you need, know what kind of setup you, you have to have. That's very important. Know your gear. Visualize the image before you capture it. That helps you later on to where you're not trying to figure out what to do with this image in post or it keeps you from even taking a photo that you don't even like to begin with, but you're kind of forcing it on yourself. Because if you, you can visualize that image, once you take it, you're going to love it. Simple as that. And then it also helps with post-processing to where you know immediately, okay, this is this is what I got to do to this image. And, you know, I, I want to bring out the clouds a little bit. So I know I have to do this, this, and this. It just makes life so much easier. Be a part of the moment. You know, a lot of times we as photographers focus so much on, especially now with social media, we're always thinking about Instagram and, and sharing our pictures, but we're not actually connecting with where we are and taking in. We're the ones that are there. Enjoy that. If the pandemic hasn't taught anybody anything, at least let it teach you that you need to take the time to actually enjoy your life and actually enjoy where you are. Because, I mean, you never know how life can change in the blink of an eye, as we just have witnessed. You know, life was so great before March of 2020, but look how things have gone since then. So learn to be a part of the moment. Don't, don't you know, just go to these places and you know, your focus is on your social media accounts. No, don't do that. And then, of course, enjoy the moment. You want to enjoy everywhere you are. That's that's very important. I know, you know, as far as points to remember, some people might feel that, hmm, I wouldn't have thought these would be his points. But these are essential, I think. So, first image up. This is one that was taken during the pandemic, which was a road trip that my business partner, um, who many of you, are, if you follow me on Instagram, uh, David Glenn, we decided to do a road trip. Um, originally, I planned to go to London for my birthday last year, but because of the pandemic, I didn't. And so I needed something else to do. So I went on a month long road trip. And this is one of the places that we went to. This is Bernie Falls in California. Very, very gorgeous waterfall. Very beautiful. So I shot the A7R4 or A7R3 here. Um, and then, so for these images, I also have the EXIF data at the bottom. Not every image here in the presentation has that. So if you want to see the additional images, I, I do list all of my images on my photo site. So you can actually pull up the EXIF data for any pictures I've, I've taken over the last like eight years. So you can pull up any of these images if you want to later. Um, so this is one that we took in Washington, oh, I'm sorry, in California last year in Bernie Falls. Beautiful, beautiful location. So this is one of the images that I was talking about earlier as far as Horseshoe Bend, where we were trying to do the Milky Way, but it didn't work here at this location. Now, What's what's uh, this is a very you know common place for for people to go to, 
I decided to use the 21, even though I had the 16 to 35. Why didn't I go wider? Because everybody else typically goes with the widest lens they possibly can, a 12 millimeter or 16. So I said, well, let me come in a little tighter with the shot and use a 21. So I was trying to come up with different compositions that other people didn't have. And, and that's, I feel very important for photographers to have. It's like, yeah, you might want to have certain compositions for your portfolio just so that way you have it, but also look beyond that and see what kind of different compositions you can create from a common location like Horseshoe Bend. And um, this, this was tricky because if you look at where the sun is, it's all the way in the back. So that means this whole canyon was not lit. So to compensate for that, I had to bracket this image. So it's a, a three exposure image that I then combined as an HDR in Lightroom. So that way I would get the, the light down here in the bottom because there's no sunlight hitting it because as you can see, the sun is all the way in the back. So this was a favorite of mine that was in New Mexico. This is Shiprock uh, shot with the 21. As you're seeing, I'm using the 21 quite a bit. And it was just so quiet here. You know, why take a trip during the pandemic? Because that's the perfect time to take a trip during the pandemic. I think other people had that same idea, like I'm not going anywhere. But it was the best time to go because there were no people out there. We rarely ran into people while we were out the entire month because we went a little early. So right, you know, when things were really, really bad is when we went out. But there was no one out there. And for that reason, that's why it was a great time. So, you know, we, if we went someplace, you know, we had our mask and things like that. But when you're out here in places like this, literally, we were the only two people out here at Ship Rock. Only two people. And we were here for maybe, maybe two and a half hours, maybe three hours. No one else was out here but us. And that was what we encountered the entire time. So it just made it so much easier. You know, even some of the parks that we went to, uh, like the Grand Canyon, there was hardly anybody there. Hardly anybody there. I was, I was amazed by that. So it was a great way to experience some of these places, if you, if, especially for me, where I've never been, to actually see it. And I have to encounter a lot of people. I could take my time, get the shots that I wanted. Just made, made it so much easier. Um, this is Cannon Beach in Oregon. Uh, again, Loxia 21, A7R3. And this is a 66 second exposure. A lot of these images, I've also used uh, filters to slow the shutter speed to, to the speeds that you see. So in this case, I, I believe I was using a six stop of uh, circular polarizer and ND combination at that time to get a 66 image, 66 second image here. And the reason I did that is because I really wanted the clouds to have this stream. So I, I, I also look at that, you know, depending on what, what do I want my overall image to have, what kind of effect, and I'll determine that uh, based on what shutter speed I decide to choose from. Um, and some of the later images you'll see where sometimes I go a little opposite. I, I may not want such a long shutter speed. I just want it to drag for a little bit of motion in the water. Here, didn't, didn't really matter. Let's make it look like it's some ice. So we can go really, really long on the shutter speed here. And then this is Grand Canyon. Majestic place, very majestic place this was. This, this image does not do this justice at all. Um, with the 21 again, um, this is handheld. This is probably one of the few images that are handheld. Many of the cityscape landscape images that I do, I do like using a tripod. Uh, but this this case, I did not do so. And just majestic scene. So this was when they had a lot of, I think, a lot of fires that were still happening over on the West Coast. So it was very hazy, but that actually worked to my advantage. So I, I sort of incorporated a little bit of that into the image as far as how I edited and, and took advantage of the haziness of the image. So here's one that is from Arches National Park, which is, I believe that's Utah. Think that's Utah um, in Moab, Utah. So 
there are times where I will have a composition where most people's thought process is to use a wide angle lens. But in this case, I did not do so. This is with a, with a 35, but this is an eight image panoramic. Why do that instead of just using a wide lens? Well, there were things at the bottom of the frame that I didn't really want in the shot. And with the wider lens, I would have had that in, in the image and would have had to crop it. So it would have <laughs> ultimately been the same sort of composition. But then I'm, I'm reducing that image, that original 42 megapixel image into something smaller. So why do that? I could just do a panoramic instead. So I took eight handheld shots. This is not with a tripod, eight handheld shots and did a panoramic of, of this section of Arches National Park. And then just um, had the uh, Lightroom combine them in, in there and went about my edits. That's, it just makes it so much simpler. So sometimes, you know, it, I have a, a much mass, more massive file, greater detail, but then in, in using the 35 instead of something wider, I also get a little bit of, of compression there. So it sort of brings my, my background up a little bit. Whereas if I had a really wide lens, it sort of makes things look a little too distant. And I didn't really want to do that. So I like the balance that the 35 gave. And this is actually a lens I utilize a lot for panoramics. So if I, if I do want a wide shot, I'll go with the 35, but then do a panoramic stitch of, of the image. So that's, that's usually my go-to lens for doing panoramics. And then here's some more images, some um, Astro stuff that we took. First image is uh, Babcock State Park, very popular park for photographers when they're traveling during the fall. Uh, we were actually surprised to actually see the stars and everything out there. It was very surprising by that. Uh, second is uh, Ship Rock again, just later in the evening. And then thirdly is the same location, but I turned around so that way I could capture that. So same location in New Mexico at Ship Rock, but just turned around. Any questions? We have three questions. Okay, I'll take one. Yeah. Here we are. John Henry Maurice, uh, Ship Rock, do you use a guide? No, we did not use a guide for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, we we just drove to so we were in my my business partner's SUV and um, he this it was a spot that he knew about and so no we none of the trips that we've done we've ever had a guide we always go on our own and we we already mapped out the locations where, of where we want to go and uh, if if it's public access to these places yeah we won't have a guide but if it's something specific where that's the only way you can see something then yeah that's something that we would consider at that point. But for ship rot specifically, yeah, we, we went on our own. Okay, thank you. And then we have two questions relative, relative to the gear. One mm -hmm. is from Robin Fisher. What do you use on top of the tripod, a ball head? What type of ball head? Um, yeah, so the ball head that I'm using right now is a Colorado tripod company ball head. And the reason I use this is because with the Arca Swiss plates, now most people that are familiar with the Arca Swiss, you know, you put the camera on the, the tripod mount and then you have to screw in, you know, screw the plate so that way it tightens to the bottom of the, the plate on the camera. The reason I like this is because it's a quick release. I haven't seen one this great before. And this was one that, that um, they actually sent me earlier this year for a project that I did uh, for a road trip. And they sent me this one and I just fell in love with it because it just makes it so much easier. So like, you know, if I have my camera here and I also have an L bracket, I didn't mention that, but I, you know, having an L bracket is very useful too. So say if I, I'm mounting the camera, all I have to do is, and it's locked. That's it. That is it. So much faster, so much easier. So I, I really swear by this ball head because it's just, it makes my life so much easier. And it has this, this tension um, mechanism here. So depending on if your uh, plate is a little bit wider or a little bit narrower, you can set it so that way once it's light locked, it's tight. 
So, you know, once I, you know, it's not going anywhere and it's snug tight on there and you can't accidentally bump it or anything like you actually have to push this in and then pull back. So it's, it's just so convenient, so convenient. Great. And then we have uh, Rondi uh, Bar. Why not say size filter? Uh, because ice doesn't make um, ND filters. ND filter, no? Okay. <laughs> that's an that's open and shut question. They do have UV filters and they have a circular polarizer, but they don't have no neutral density filters. Um, so that, okay. that's the reason why the, the NDs and stuff that I'm using are not size. Okay, okay. And then the last one from Chris Mastriano. What influences you, uh, your choice using the AR7 III for the star shots? Uh, just for the, the it, it's a little, at the time I had that camera and the nine. Mm -hmm. So depending on the, the 7S III didn't come about until the end of last year, obviously, because that's when it was launched. So the reason of the 7R over the 9 is because the 7R is a little bit better at the higher ISOs. And then two, it's um, for my, my more majestic Vista type images, I, I usually go for the higher megapixel cameras in that regards. Not all the time, of course, as I mentioned at the start of this, where you know I use 24 megapixels quite a bit. But it's it's a it was a better low light choice, so that's why I assigned the R for that. Um, so that that's the reason. Great, great, great! And then we have a uh, Robin Fisher that uh, uh, he asked if you can repeat the name of the ball head. Colorado Tripod uh, Company ball head, and it is, I believe that's an Aspen ball head. But if you're looking for it online, you won't be able to find it. Because trust me, I tried to find, I tried to buy a second one, but you cannot find it. They have the traditional one with the screw that's available, I believe, that you can find online. But this specific one, it, I have not been able to find it anywhere. And I've been looking for months. <laughs> <laughs> but um, okay. that's that's the uh, the name of it. And everything that I, I have listed also is people can, if, if they go back in the video and look at the link that I have at the bottom, I, I have everything listed on my website also with the exact link. So, you know, if there's something that people miss, they can always refer to my website because every single piece of gear that I own and use is listed there. That's great. So, guys, just go to... Uh, what's your web website, by the way? <laughs> uh, professorhines.com. <laughs> okay, cool. So go to professorhines.com and check the gear. Easy. Thank you, Kenneth. Okay, so here's some more images that we took on our road trip. First image, Cannon Beach again. And second one was, this is actually Crater Lake, but the sunset was opposite of where the lake was. And it was just a very nice image. And I wanted to capture that. Again, another difficult photo because of where the sun was, there was no light at the bottom. So I had to do another bracket for this. And that's a three exposure. And then, of course, the, the popular Multnomah Falls along the Columbia River Gorge in Oregon. I've been wanting to photograph this place for, for a long time. It's still not the photo that I want, so I have to go back there because my business partner took an image there some years ago, and I actually asked him to edit his photo. I'm like, oh no, I, I, I got to edit this. So he sent me the picture, and I knew exactly how I wanted it to look. So I want a picture of that of my own but I have not gotten that yet. That's not the picture that I want. It's okay just to have, but that's not the photo that I want. I know what I want and that's not it, but it works. It, it, it worked, at least I got it and was able to finally see Multnomah in person. Okay, some tips for cityscapes and landscapes. One, determine your vantage point and then choose your lens or lenses. Why is that important? Because it eliminates you going someplace and then being uncertain as to what equipment you need, especially for someone like myself who, sh who shoots primarily with prime lenses. So you don't want to be indecisive about what you're doing and what you're going to, to use. And you really want to, like everything that I do is very strategic. Um, it's, it's very calculated. Of course, there's, 
elements that I can't control, but I try to be as calculated as I can. So that way I don't waste time in the field um, trying to think about what I want to utilize, what settings I may need or any, anything like that. So it's, it's very good to go in knowing what, what lenses you need to have immediately. And so that way you're not finicking with any kind of changing lenses or uncertain as far as if you're using a zoom lens. You know, you might be going from 24 and it's like, oh, let me see how 50 looks. No, you just want to immediately know what is it that you need. So that that just makes things so much easier for you. Secondly, be attentive to light. Now, this is more specific to people who may be just starting in cityscapes and landscapes. And they may be someone that may be a portrait photographer or a wedding photographer on a general basis. And you might be someone that you utilize artificial lighting a lot. So you're controlling that. But learning how to follow light naturally, you sort of have to practice with. Because, I mean, as I've shown a few scenarios where the light is not lighting the actual subject that I want, how do I avoid that? Okay, well, I have to actually bracket this image because I need to get that light in this one specific area. And you have to really know where the light is moving, where it's it's shifting to. That's why I utilize photo pills so that way I can actually track and see where is the light going to be falling, you know, for a sunset or something. That's very important because the light changes so quickly and it can be a drastic difference that if you take one image right now and then take that same image 10 minutes later, the images will look drastically different because the light is so different. So really being attentive to the light and knowing how to capture that is going to be probably your biggest asset ever, biggest one that you could possibly have. Always clean your gear. I've had a lot of students. The reason I have this is because I've taught a lot of students over the years. And they'll send me pictures to review. And even when I've done portfolio reviews, I don't care how good of a photographer someone is. The, the image could be the most amazing photo you've ever taken. But if I see dust particles in that image, I would give it ultimate F regardless of how the image looks. I would give an ultimate F for that. <laughs> and the reason being is because, so for, for instance, why, why am I so strict about that? Look at the pictures behind me. They're very massive. They're, these are 40 by 60 and 20 by 60 images behind me. So anything of this magnitude is going to be very noticeable as opposed to when people look at images on their phone or on a computer screen that's a lot smaller. So certain details you're not going to see as visibly as if you're viewing something in a much larger scenario in the case like these pictures behind me. As someone who sells and licenses their art, having the most pristine quality possible is very important to me. And for people who are, you know, really trying to make photography a business or they do this for a living or whatever it may be. Having that sort of a care for attention of detail to their artwork is very crucial. So if I see someone who is taking a class with me or they're doing a portfolio review and I see things like that, that means that they're not paying attention to, to their, their art. They're not paying attention to everything that is involved with taking that picture. Because if you can produce something like that and not, even if you go through, if you have it, correcting it in post, if you still didn't do that, that means you're, you're it's kind of like going at it in a sloppy manner. It, that's just, uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm sure I'll probably get negative mail. I don't look at negative mail. I don't care about negative mail. I'm just saying that's how you should be with, especially this type of work, because it is, it is less forgiving because when you're using those stop down apertures, things are more visible as opposed to if you're doing a portrait, if you're shooting more wide open, it's not as noticeable because of that. But stopping down is where you start seeing all that dirt and things. If it's on your sensor, it'll, it'll be very visible in your image, especially sky scenes like this. You're gonna see that. So make sure your gear is clean. I clean my gear before every landscape, 
cityscape shoot that I do because I don't want to come back with a hundred images that have the same dust spot in every single image. And now I have to correct that because I don't like to spend a lot of time in post. So that's important. So I clean my own sensors. I clean my own lenses. I have my, my Zeiss cleaning kit in my bag that I, I keep at all times. So that way I, I keep everything in, in clean working order. That's important. Um, use manual focusing. You know, I, I talked about this sort of uh, a little bit at the beginning of using manual focusing, but mechanical lenses work best. And it goes back to, you know, and not using an autofocus lens. I have a lot of people that ask me periodically, why is it that you have manual specific lens when you can just use an autofocus lens and switch it to manual? Well, I'll give you an example. I have someone that I know um, who just shared this morning that he was out shooting and he accidentally was changing batteries or took out his camera battery without before turning the camera off. So when he put the uh, new battery in, his settings had reset, but something that he did not know is that his focus had shifted on the lens, even though it was set to manual focus. That's something that can happen when you're using a lens that's focused by wire and is controlled electronically. That's why I, I like using a manual specific lens. I won't ever have that issue happen, never in life. Because when I set that focus on the lens, unless I physically move it, doesn't matter if I change the battery or whatever I'm doing to the camera, that lens is not going to change. Whereas focus by wire system, that's something that can happen and that happened to a photographer. So that's, that's why I have specific lenses that are mechanical manual lenses and why I like using the Zeiss Loxy lenses. But of course you can use whatever you want, but I just, for having situations where you might not be paying attention, but again, you just need to be attentive to what you're doing. That, that's very important. So that's why I like using the manual lenses. It allows me to slow down. It allows me to actually look at what I'm doing so that way I don't have mistakes take place. Because if I rely on the technology, the technology can mess up on me. And if I'm not double checking that, I will come back with having ruined images. So that's that's very critical. Because say if you're going someplace and you that's the only time you'll get to go to that location. You want to make sure you have the best image possible. You don't want to come away having out of focus images, do you? So that's why I, I use the gear that I do and that's why I use manual specific lenses. Any questions so far? We have a few. We have okay. a few. Okay. Um, let's see here. We have Chris Martiano. How do you prevent dust getting on the sensor while changing lenses in the field? <laughs> I need to compose my words for that one because this is actually a funny story on top of that. So as, as, as I mentioned, I use the Sony A1. Now that camera has where it, before you change a lens, if you turn the camera off, the shutter will actually block the sensor. I actually don't, don't like it. So I actually have mine disabled. So when I change lenses, I'm, I, my sensor is actually exposed. Now, here's the funny story to that. So my business partner, Dave, he is the most cautious person I've ever seen in changing a lens. Sometimes I can, I can eat a whole bag of chips before he's finished switching his lenses on his camera. That's how cautious he is. The funny bit to it is that he always has stuff on his sensor. And I'm just like, how on earth does that still happen to you? Whereas me, on the other hand, now I'm careful. I, I take care of my gear. But sometimes I just, you know, oh, let me change this lens. Let me go ahead and put this lens on. He's like, don't, don't do it that way. What? But I never have dust on my, my sensor. He can't ever understand why that is. I don't either. Because he's so much more cautious than I am. But yet he always has more on his sensor than I did. So I don't really know. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> I, so 
That was to say, I don't know. Like I said, all of that to, to basically say, I really have no idea. Uh, like on the one reason I don't, I, I tried it with the 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 shutter block or the the sensor block with the shutter uh, coming down, and I actually still had stuff on my sensor. And because you know, I don't want to accidentally bump that one day or something because that's such a delicate uh, mechanical piece in the camera. I just decided to leave it off. I'm like, I, I've been going this many years without it. So what's, what is it to, to have the A1 not have that on either? So I don't even worry about it because it's not something that I've, I've really dealt with anyways, because I just make it a part of my sort of workflow to never have uh, a situation where I go out and I don't clean my gear. It just keeps me in that mindset to always check my gear before I go shoot. Just always check my gear. Okay, okay. Then we have uh, Jason Alter. You clean your sensor, but most are told to not to do that on their own. Are there courses or guidances on cleaning your own sensor? Probably in YouTube there are many tutorials. But... Yeah, there are many tutorials. I've even done tutorials on them on my own YouTube channel. <laughs> um, I've been cleaning my own sensor for, I think, like seven seven or so years, even back when I had the Sony A mount with the translucent mirrors, because, you know, I'll just, you know, flip the, the, the um, translucent mirror out of the way and clean my sensor, because even then my sensor could still get dirty, because when you're doing this on a regular basis, I mean, if you had to send your camera in, you'll be sending your camera in a lot, but that's why I'm, I'm, I'm adding a second A1, so it will minimize even further my having to switch lenses while I'm out in the field. I can just keep a lens attached. And like I said, I mainly use the Loxia 21 and 35, so I can have one or the other on each camera body. So that that's kind of how I'm mitigating that whole issue to begin with. Um, so as, as far as cleaning the sensor, I mean, I've been doing it so long, I've never had an issue with it. Uh, if you're someone that's hesitant to do it, I would say, you know, take it take it to someone and have it professionally cleaned if you you know that way you don't damage anything um it's i really find it hard to do so but if it's, if it's just something of a concern take it to get it professionally done okay thank you and uh, the last one we have paul collier do you use hdrs for bracketed exposures or do you ever use luminosity masks always just hdr um, I don't, because um, I would assume that with the luminosity mass is that that was tied to using Photoshop, and I don't use. Eh, I don't want to say I don't use Photoshop, but the ninety-eight percent of my edits are all done in Lightroom, and so I I do the brackets in camera, and then I bring those bracketed images into Lightroom and have the program merge the images together for me there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So some additional tips. Obtain the best equipment you can for the moment. Lenses, tripods, and rent if needed. So my business partner, Dave, told me years ago, he said that he, he, rent, he rented gear a lot. And the reason he did that was because if he went someplace and he never got a chance to go there again, he wanted to make sure that he had the best image he possibly could from that location. Because here's the, here's the thing. Say if my ability in editing is not really up to par yet, but I get the images perfect as I can because I had the best equipment I could at that time, I can come back to that old photo later on and remaster it with the skills that I've now learned with post-processing and bring it up to my standards of today as opposed to back then. Because I have that good quality file, I can do that and I can remaster that image over time. You know, some people are concerned saying, oh, you know, I see this often when they look at my images. You know, they they feel that they need a Sony A1. No, you don't need a, a $6,500 camera. You don't. You can use a camera like an A7C. You can use a camera like an A6100. It's a good camera body. You just need good glass. If you have good glass, you can make any camera a thousand times better than what it is. A lot of times, and, and I see this often, is many people who, tr who try to compare their work to mine, 
I always ask this immediate question. What lenses are you using? Nine out of 10 times, it's the kit lenses. You're not going to get the same quality that I get because I'm using totally different lenses from you. Now, I said quality lenses. I didn't say expensive lenses. I just said quality lenses because a lot of the, the Zeiss lenses I'm using, the Loxia lenses, like the 50 is an, it's only $950. So it's, it's not relatively that expensive as compared to some of the other lenses that are out there on the market. But Zeiss does quality glass. That's the key. Quality makes a difference. To where I would take images that were on a crop body, like my old A6000. And they're like, you took that with an A6000? Yeah. Because most people who had that camera, normally they started with the 6000 and the kit lens. But as they get better, they change the camera and the lens. So most people don't really get to see how great that camera is before they've now gone on to something else. That's why I retained mine and just put the good glass on there to show people this is a good camera. It just has to have the right, right glass for it. So with these landscape moments, having that good gear is essential because there are times where it, I was not really into photography back then, but I went to Alaska 21 years ago. If I had, you know, kit gear and I, I looked at that today and I'm like, I definitely have to go back there because I got to reshoot this because my gear wasn't that great. As opposed to there are some trips that I've done maybe six, seven years ago. But because I shot it with good gear, I can go back and remaster it with new techniques that I've learned in post-processing to bring it up to the standards of my images today. To where if I post an image taken this year as opposed to seven years ago, you can't tell the difference. That's what I strive to have. So if, if you have to rent the gear, rent the gear. You know, it's it's a much affordable way of doing it. And, you know, if you are, are hesitant about damaging the gear, they have where you can get the protection added to it as well. So don't don't feel like you can't have the best that you can. You can rent it. Very simple, very easy. So just make sure you have the best gear that you can. So that way, you know, later on, you have what you need. Um, now, some of these are going to be a little funny, but I'm telling you, it's important. It's important because I have experienced some of this stuff. And it's like, I get to come back and tell you about it. Have proper clothing. It's probably not something you would expect in a photography presentation, but trust me, it's very important. And especially shoes. So thank God a lot of you, like my community was not this big several years ago. I hate to admit to this story, but I feel the better that you know, the better chances you have of not replicating some of the mistakes that I've made over the years. So I had some shoes and you can actually find this video on my YouTube channel if you dig deep enough. Went hiking. Now, to be fair, my business partner will say, I didn't have adequate shoes. Yes, I did. I had some hiking shoes. They were hiking shoes. To this day, I still stand behind that. They were hiking shoes. But here's the issue. The, the shoes didn't make the hike. Because by the time we were coming back, we noticed there were some pieces missing. I looked down at my feet. My feet. My shoes were disintegrating, literally. So by the end of the trail, we still hadn't gotten to the end yet. So you know the, the, the top part of the shoes, you know, where your shoelaces actually, you know, are, are holding together? Yeah, that was, still, that was still tied to my foot. But it was just to hold on the piece that, that is tied to the, the shoe, shoe strings. The rest of the shoe was gone. I literally was hiking in my socks. So by, by midway through this hike, I was in a plastic bag on one foot. By, by the time before we got back to the car, I was in two plastic bags on both feet with these two pieces just still, like my shoe strings are still tied. Like they're perfectly tied. But the rest of the shoes weren't there. So high quality shoes is essential. Now, that never happened again, but to be fair, I had proper shoes. They just fell apart. I thought they were, however he, he, people want to look at that. 
So having proper clothes is very important. You know, I, uh, my, my friend and I, we, we have, you know, we, we have hiking shoes. We have waterproof shoes. Uh, we have water shoes. So like when I was just in Hawaii, I had my water shoes for moments where I need to get in the water. So you just need to be prepared. Plan where you're going. Be strategic about it and have the proper uh, clothes and, uh, you know, shoes that you need because that's going to be important. We actually had where a friend came for a hike that we did earlier this year. Didn't have the proper shoes. As soon as we started the, the hike, he slipped and fell because he did not have the proper shoes. Whereas our shoes, we had the grip. So there are rocks that literally were sliding down into the gorge. And you want to have, even, even when having good grip, you could still slip. You know, if you're in situations where you're you have ice or snow or anything like that, get you some yak traps for your shoes so that way you can, you know, plug into that ice and, and still hike along. So that stuff is very essential. So make sure you know the climate and the weather where you're going because that's essential. Know how to read an atlas. So why did I put that? And I actually just put that at the last minute, maybe two hours ago. That was important to, to add because I've had people who, you know, it, it might seem crazy, but there are people who do not know how to read a map. There are going to be times where you're not going to have cell service. You're not going to be able to have a GPS system talking to you. And there are times where we've had to, I mean, remember, I said that with Google Maps, there are some trails that I've added to Google Maps that were not even available in the GPS system. So you have to know how to read an atlas. You have to know how to read a paper map if you're trying to find a lot of these locations because some of them, that's the only way you're going to find them. You're not going to find them via GPS because they're not in a GPS system. So you need to know how to understand and read a map, read a paper uh, map atlas. That's, that's very, very important. So any questions up until that point? We have, uh, yeah, we always have questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me see. Okay, I, at two o'clock. Okay, I need to speed it up. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one, one question and you move forward. Kingsley Gorgeous uh, Popono, uh, do you use the same workflow for landscape and seascapes? Uh, I like what, seascapes. What was the question again? Uh, do you use the same workflow, photography workflow for landscapes and seascapes? Pretty much, yes. Pretty much. Um, I mean, the cityscapes don't require as much as the landscapes, just because, for, just to give you a scenario. So with the trip that I did to Hawaii, you know, I'm, I'm having to put in... The, the aspect of being on a location that is probably not not paved, I'm hiking through a trail or something like that. Whereas doing a cityscape, I'm usually at a location that, you know, is is paved, you know, it's maybe a sidewalk or something like that. So it's 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 not as challenging usually as opposed to a landscape where there is a bigger challenge factor involved there, if the, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So let's move on. Okay. So let me go through quickly with some of these pictures. So <laughs> this is one of my new photos that I absolutely love. And unfortunately, you all didn't get to see it on my wall because this image will be over here on this side. This, this image will be retired. And this image is going up over there. But this is one of my new epic shots that I absolutely love <laughs> from Hawaii. This was a killer sunset. Oh, my goodness. So I was out there with a friend that I just met uh, going out to Hawaii, and he was showing me a location up in uh, North uh, Oahu. He took me to his spot, but then I, being the person that I am, I said, but I want to go over there. Like, I want to go further down. He said he had never been down there, so we decided to take the hike on down. He was like, man, I've been coming here for a long time, but I've never been over here, and this is the this is the money shot. And I was like, exactly, exactly. You're welcome. So this is where I got this killer shot. When I saw it, I knew immediately like, oh, I, I have to take this in the Lightroom and really. So what I do a lot is exaggerate 
certain things. Like I, I love having those majestic clouds and things. And so this image just worked, just worked. Of course, Loxia 21 again. And this is with the, the Sony A1. Um, this is another Hawaii shot that I just took. This was actually on my last day there, um, you know, shooting with the 21. And as you can see, the, the, the exposures are different on these two. Look at this is 25 seconds. This is a fifth of a second. Why is that? Well, on this one, I don't have crashing water. And so I can actually go longer with the exposure because I'm not trying to have the water look a specific way. And I can actually just, you know, catch the motion of the clouds and sort of have that nice ice looking water on this image. Whereas this one, I, I want to be able to see the texture of the rock. So if I'm if I go too long with the speed of the shutter, then as that water crashes over repeatedly, it eliminates that. And I didn't want to do that. So that's why I went such a short shutter speed. But look, even with that one fifth of a second, look at how much drag there is. So it's it's important to note that you also have to be mindful as far as is as, as speed. Now, being that I was someone who majored mathematics, I'm probably a little bit more technical on this side and, and utilizing numbers. But I, I analyze speed a lot for everything that I do to determine what I'm setting my, my, my or trying to obtain for my shutter speed. The reason being is because in this situation, look at how quickly the water is moving. That will give you the speed that you need. So because the, the, the water is moving so rapidly, I don't have to go that long on the shutter speed. If I just do in doing a fifth of a second, it dragged it enough to where I get sort of that nice little drag in the motion, but then I can still see the texture of the rock underneath the water because it's not so much of the water passing in that short time frame for that exposure. Makes sense, doesn't it? Oh, this um, situation here, this is a fall image, um, Babcock State Falls. And uh, with the Loxia 21, again, I said I shoot this lens a lot. Uh, another one of my pandemic endeavors, which I really love. This was a shot that I've never seen anyone take here. I was the only photographer shooting. But then where people get the iconic shot, people saw where I was and then others started coming. But by this time, I had already gotten my shot. But that's what I like to do. Find compositions that other people aren't taking because it makes mine more unique. And it's also the same image that I have over here. I just realized that. <laughs> so this is um, another from the pandemic trip. This is, where is this? <laughs> this is Sparks Lake, Oregon. I had to think about that. So this is a scenario I know a lot of people ask sometimes, where do I focus in situations like this? Well, in this case, I actually focus more out to the mountains. Now, the further out that I, I set my focus, I then am having where the foreground rocks will be a little bit out of focus just because of that, that drastic dif uh, difference in the distance. So sometimes, depending on the composition of what I want, I might focus midway through. So that way you get the foreground in focus and the background will be pretty much in focus, the entire image pretty much in focus. So depending on what the image is, you know, I might change and I, I might not care about the rock, but other times I might. So it just depends, just depends. Um, one of my favorite shots, an iconic shot of the New York skyline, shot with the 21, um, ISO 640. Now, this is with the tripod and something that in, in the event that someone notices, I don't always shoot super low ISOs. I don't, I don't have to do that. Uh, these cameras are built to, to go higher in ISOs. And if you're using good glass, you actually can get away with going higher. And a lot of people don't really realize that the lens that you use will determine how far you can go with your ISO because it will take advantage of that sensor's capability because it has that resolving power. So that way you can have cleaner images at higher ISOs. So just, just a little note to that. That's why if you notice some of the images are a little bit higher, even if I'm using a tripod, that's why it doesn't really matter. Um, it's an indoor cityscape image, uh, the new summit building. Um, and this is, uh, with the 12 millimeter uh, G lens. In this situation, if I had the 16, it wouldn't have been the same effect. I really, really needed that ultra wide shot. And this is a handheld shot. And, and case in point, ISO 2000. Have no problem shooting at that high of an ISO. No problems at all. It's a super clean, crisp image. Using quality glass makes a difference. 
Here's another G lens, 12 uh, to 24, shot at 15. Um, and one of the rare instances, I'm at all the way at the bottom of ISO 50. One of my favorite shots of uh, Battery Park in New York City. So this is a handheld 21 millimeter shot uh, where there are times where I look for elements that are very different. I mean, this is a shot that people take often. But I saw this reflection. And I knew immediately, oh, yeah, we need to get that. It's something different. I, I look for things, you know, I look for reflections. I look for things that are around to add into the image that gives you a different perspective of a scene that you may see on a continuous basis. A lot of people photograph this but I wanted something different. And so that's, that's different. So this is a, a waterfall in Tennessee, very difficult to get to, but very worth it. And one of the images that I have right behind me. So funny story with this. Um, I, I saw this waterfall, knew exactly the composition I wanted. And it, it was very difficult to hike down. Like you're hiking down, it's, it's literally a cable trail. And it's kind of steep as well to get down there. So when we got down here, uh, my friend Dave, you know, he, he was with me. I took two shots, two shots. I took this horizontal and then I took this vertical shot that you see behind me. And he looked and, and I, I said, okay, I'm ready to go. He's like, you're done? And I was like, yep. It was almost, you know, this is gonna get dark soon. And I, I saw the scene, I analyzed the scene. I knew the compositions I wanted and I, I said, I got the, the shots that I wanted. I always take vertical and I always take horizontal. Vertical is for posting on social media because it looks better when displayed, like on Instagram because it shows bigger than the um, horizontal images. But then there are some instances where I might have a usage for the vertical, like in this case where I used it for these panels. Um, but then the horizontal I used to sell. So that's why I take two compositions. I don't crop. Um, I don't like to crop an image into the different orientation. So I took the two and I said, okay, I'm good. He's like, you're done? Yeah, we can go. And we we left. Once I see a shot, I take it and I'm good. I'm good to go. I'm good to go. I don't have to linger. Don't have to linger. I'm not trying to go through 300 photos at the same shot. If I can get it in a couple frames, I get it in a couple of frames, especially because I'm using such high megapixel cameras, you know, shooting 42 and 50 megapixels. I'm not trying to have a lot of raw files. No, not at all. And I want what I have to be the ultimate best. I don't want to have to go through later. And, uh, is this okay? Is this one okay? Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to have to do that. I don't want to have to do that. So this is one from Albany, the capital of New York, Albany. And really, really like this shot. It was really good. The water was already still, but then it had a little bit of, because there were ducks here. So I wanted to eliminate the motion. So that's why I went 25 seconds here. Um, this was from my recent fall trip of a month ago in upstate New York. Uh, this is a ultra wide with the 12 uh, to 24. And I believe I mislabeled that. That's actually a 12 millimeter, not 15. This is one from a helicopter tour in New York with the 55 sonar, uh, which was a really great shot. I really love the One World Trade Center building. So that's why anytime I'm usually capturing the skyline of New York, I always like to have the One World Trade building, which is the tallest building in the middle there. And you actually see a helicopter, and that was the police helicopter. So that was a very fun catch for me to, to actually have that. And as you can see, high ISO 1250, but it's super clean, super clean image. Like I blew that image up on this side here, and it's a super clean image. And, you know, sure, someone might point out it's an F2. At that distance, it really does not matter because I'm focused to infinity at that point. So everything's in focus. So at F2, I need the speed because um, it was, as the helicopter is moving around, you know, the lighting is changing. So on this side, I had more light just because I'm aiming into the sun. Whereas when we were coming on the opposite side, didn't have that, so it was a little darker. So I like to set my ISO and just leave it. I don't, uh, most times I'm shooting aperture, 
aperture priority. The only time I shoot manual is if I'm in bulb mode beyond 30 seconds. That's the only time. Um, here's a shot from Brooklyn Bridge, which was a sunrise. I don't do many sunrises, but this was a morning where I just saw, I was tracking the weather and I was like, I need to go out. I need to go out because I think this is going to be a good, good morning. And it was very good morning. And um, this was where I was boarding a flight, but I just happened to be waiting to check my bag at JFK terminal. And I'm like, look at that sunset coming through. So I said, I, I want sort of a silhouette, but I don't want the people to be completely in darkness. Like I, I want you to be able to see like certain colors or certain shirts and textures, but I wanted, you know, sort of the sun set to be the focus of the image. And I just thought it was a really cool image while I'm standing there in line. I'm, I'm not doing anything. So I'm just looking around and I happen to see that and took a picture. And then this is another situation where I shot with the 35 and then did a panoramic. So this is a seven image panoramic uh, stitched together in a uh, Lightroom. And then this is a situation where same location, same time, well, not same time, obviously, but they were just minutes apart. Where on the left, you see earlier, the sky was super red and I had the 85 on the nine. And then I had the one paired with the 21. So as the sun went down, look at how drastically different the scene changed. So it's like, I, I love sitting in a location to have those different scenes because again, being attent attentive to the light, that's very essential. So as we come down to the end, here's a little bit of my sort of workflow in Lightroom. I'll go through uh, Lightroom and show you a little bit. But what I do is once I go through with my images, I bring them into, Lightroom, I, I have everything categorized based on camera model. So in the recent instance where I'm shooting with the A1, I have the A1 sorted by the month, so October or November, and then just dump the folders and I have them dated in the camera. So all my file uh, folders are dates. Because I actually remember most of the, the dates for when I do certain travels, which is very scary. And so when I go into Lightroom, I go through and just pick the images that I want to sort of be my, my primary set that I edit. Now, I do come back and edit others as I, I generally will know, oh, yeah, there are some other images that may have just been duplicates or something. And I still want to use this other frame just because there may be something very subtle, subtly different from this frame to another. And so this just shows you like what sort of my process is in utilizing Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop. And I use Adobe Lightroom Classic. Um, uh, if you're someone that may have watched my Adobe Max presentation, I was using Adobe Lightroom, the cloud-based version. I use Classic because I have so many images. I have over 100,000 images in my catalog. And then there are certain functions that Classic does that you don't have in the cloud-based version and vice versa. But I do use both versions, but I'm more so a um, classic user as opposed to a um, regular Lightroom user. So I'm gonna go into Lightroom, but the for the presentation, screenshot mm -hmm. this if you have to. Uh -huh. You can find me on Instagram, Professor Hines, and my YouTube channel, Professor Hines' Choice. And then of course my website, professorhines.com. So I'll take some questions here and if anyone has them and then I'll pop into Lightroom for a bit and then we'll conclude. Okay, awesome. Have a few questions. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Oh, here's one. Uh, Fabio Mincarelli Monfrin. Did you do focus blending on that photo in Hawaii, the one with the rocks? Or yeah. using F11 was enough to have everything sharply in focus? F11 was enough because I, so in this image, it's actually one of the same, same uh, from the same set, but a different photo. So if you look in this image here on the right, if you see those, those rocks, the, the last rocks before that big hill where the sun is sort of coming off, my focus is hitting there. So I'm basically sort of in the middle. Because of that, the foreground is, is perfectly sharp and focused, as well as those back rocks back there. 
And now you can't really see the, the mountain back there. It's probably in focus too, but it was a haze back there. So, but that's why that was in focus. So I didn't, I didn't have to worry about focus stacking for that. But that's how come uh, for one of the images that I said, where depending on where you set the focus, it will either, you know, allow you to have where your foreground scene will also be in focus. Or if you set it further out, then you'll sort of blur that a little bit, even if you are stopped down to F11. So it just depends on what sort of results you want. In this case, I wanted those foreground rocks. So that's why I, I wasn't aiming my focus too far out. I didn't want to do that. So I, I'm focused more here in the middle. So that way it allows those foreground rocks to be in focus at F11. Awesome. Man, let's go into Lightroom then. Okay. So we come over here. So this is kind of like where, where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. So I put my pictures on my desktop and then I'll bring them into uh, Lightroom. And as you can see, I have everything sorted by camera and then it goes to the year and then to the month. And then I choose whichever folder that I want to go into. So let's see, let's uh, go to this image because I've, I've shown this once. So kind of like, what do I, what is my, my uh, sort of workflow here in Lightroom? A lot of people think that my look comes from what I do in post-processing. They just don't believe that it comes from in the camera. Now, of course, this is not straight out of the camera. Like if you saw the JPEG, it's actually more close to what the edit is because the raw files, you know, it's resetting all of the settings that you applied in camera. So it's going to be a little bit darker and you're not going to have certain features in the raw image when you view it this way here in Lightroom. But I, I try to get the as close to what I want in the camera. So that way, when I do the post-processing, I have everything that I need. And in just doing, I'm only going to show you just basic functions. If you want to see the, the extended version, I will have a version of this later on on my YouTube channel. But just for the sake of time, I'm just going to show you a very, very basic uh, situation of how I go through editing and get my, my signature look. So for here, my profile, I always start with Adobe Standard. Um, I'm just going to show you with exposure. Exposure and adjusting shadows, uh, black levels, that sort of thing. And what that will drastically do to my images and why when people view them, they they feel that there's sort of a very unique look in terms of how my colors are and then the level of contrast. And it's it all starts with with what I'm shooting with, like the Zeiss lenses and how they capture color is just amazing. Oh, it's phenomenal. This is why I use Zeiss lenses. It's something I didn't mention in saying that. Why do I shoot Zeiss lenses? Because it makes my job easier. Every lens that I showed you of Zeiss is color matched. So say if I were to use the 16 to 35 or go to Aloxia 21, the colors are going to be the same. doesn't matter. But the different family of lenses, so a bodice to Aloxia, Aloxia to uh, Otis, they do have their defining characteristics to that specific family. In terms of the colors, it doesn't matter. I don't have to worry about that. And why is that essential for what I do? Because I'm not having to worry about my editing for a specific rendering of a lens. So I can change a lens during a specific um, set of images and know that I'm not going to have different effects from one Im image to the other because I use different lenses. I'm going to have the same colors regardless. So it just makes things a lot easier in the post-processing. I'm not having to think about that. I can just think about the photos themselves. So, but just looking at this raw image, you see, you don't see my sort of signature look. You, you kind of see it materializing, but it's not quite there. How do we get it there? Well, one thing is, let's start off using this new masking tool here in Lightroom. So I'm going to come in, select my masking. I'm going to do select sky. And I hope this doesn't crash on me because I did just update this and it crashed in my last session. Let's hope it doesn't do that today. Um, so it now has done the select sky. And what I want to do is exaggerate those clouds. That's all I want to do. That's all I want to do. 
So what? how I do that is bring up my clarity. And then we're going to drop the black. And see, I haven't done anything yet. I haven't, like, I'm just doing, adding clarity and dropping blacks. I haven't done any color adjustments. Like, I'm not going to do any color adjustments. I just want you to see what just uh, manipulating the, the, the contrast levels and of uh, shadows and, and, and white levels, what that does to my images. And, and what I have to start with on the image itself, you know, it just makes life so much easier. So that's just with the sky there. So next I want to highlight these buildings. So I'm gonna do a new mask. We're gonna create new. We're gonna do select subject. So one thing with select subject, it doesn't just work on people, it works on, you know, inanimate objects, whatever the, the program sees, but it's not always 100% perfect and I'll show you how to correct that. So here we have the skyline was selected, but it didn't include all the buildings. How do we fix that? I'll just add to the mask and I'll add a brush. So because I'm adding to that same layer, all of my adjustments will still apply the same way in adding this new mask. So we'll just add this area here and there we go. So once I've done that, all I do is bring up my shadow level, bring down the black a bit, add a little clarity in there and see how we're getting that definition there in the buildings. And then if I want to, I could bring up the exposure a bit if I want it to maybe drop those black levels again. That looks good. So then we want to do another mask. And what I want to do is I now want to edit the, the water and the rocks. So I might do a select sky again. And watch why I did that. Because I already done it once, but I'm going to show you why I'm doing it a second time. So with select sky, I'm going to select the invert. And that selects everything but the sky. But then we also have these buildings in here, which we don't want again. So I'll do the subtract mask, which acts as an eraser. And I'll come in here. It doesn't have to be neat. And we'll just remove the area we don't want to be in our adjustments. So once we've done that, I'll bring up the shadows here. Maybe bring in the white level, bring in the exposure. Bring down the black level, bring in a little clarity. Boom, that's it. I haven't done anything yet. I have not done anything yet, but just some minor adjustments to my shadows, my black level, shadows, whites, clarity. That's all I've done. Let's look at the before and after of that. Look at that. I, I still have not done color adjustments. I have not touched the tone curve. I've not done color grading. I've not done any of that. That is how I get my look. That is it. I just make it more, it's a perception. It's sort of like an optical illusion. I just give my edges in my images a more, more definition. So that way, when you see the colors, it makes those stand out more because the contrast level to that color, it just, it just gives your eye something to target. That's all it is. That is all it is. You know, there there's some photographers that's like, why is he telling all this? He's telling all his secrets. It's not a secret. It is not a secret. I don't care how much I, I teach this to anybody. No one will ever take a, a photo like you. No one will ever see things the same way. I can give someone my exact camera, lens, give them the exact tools that I use. They will never have a photo like mine. Now, I have seen photographers where they might go to the, some of the same locations they might have bought some of my presets and might want to use some of my presets. And their image might look very close to mine. Or it might even be better than mine. I don't care. I want it to be better than mine. Because what that does, if I see that, I look at it and I'm like, hmm, something I hadn't thought about before. I need to go back out someplace and um, let's, let's try to re-up on this. I, I, that's how I continue to make myself better and better. So if people aren't doing the work that I do and doing better than I am, then I will never get better. So that's why I, I teach everything because I want people to use utilize these tools to really add more to, to what they're doing. You know, there's so much to Lightroom that people don't utilize. And I'm like, you can bring so much more out of your images. So when I see what they do, 
if they're, you know, learn from me and as they continue to learn from others and then they get better and then I see their work and they've gotten better than me. Oh, that pushes me to get better again. So that way I'm constantly improving what I do. So there's that. Hopefully everybody enjoyed this. I know this was long. I'm long winded. I, 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 I told, I told you this, I'm, I'm, I can be long winded, but it's so much information. And I just want to make sure that I, I share as much as I can in a short period of time. It's been awesome, man. Thank you for the presentation. I certainly so appreciate it. Um, was delighted to do this. I'm glad that um, <laughs> you invited me for this. Little old me. Yeah. And then you shared the whole the whole uh, workflow and you know, from the idea to the planning to the gear to the settings and a bit of editing. It's it's just great. We have a few questions, by the way. Uh, if you don't mind, no, go for it. Answering them uh, first. We have uh, Sharon. Meet him from uh, Tennessee, and she's interested in the name of the waterfall in Tennessee. It's uh, her her home state. Um, that is from Fall Creek Falls State Park. Uh, okay. There's there are there are several waterfalls within that park. That specific one is Cane Creek Falls. Mm -hmm. um, now there's actually two within that same set but i you, you didn't see it in my my photo because it's sort of to the side but it's taller but it's thinner um that one is called the bridal bridal veil falls so there's sort of an overlook where you can see the waterfalls but you're actually uh back behind it and i'll actually go back to that photo mm -hmm. so let's pull that up there so if you look here there's actually an overlook that's right there so you're actually in between the two waterfalls. So the other waterfall is to the left here. Mm -hmm. This is the main falls, but the only way to see them, you have to hike down. The hike down is very interesting. It's very interesting, uh, but it's not as bad as it might look when you're looking at it from the top. Um, but it's it's beautiful once you get down there. It's, it's, it's actually easier going back up and being that I'm, I'm much taller, it, it's actually um, easier because then I can actually stretch <laughs> far enough to where from going from one rock to the other, it's, it's a little bit uh, easier for me. But yeah, this is uh, within Fall Creek Falls State Park. Uh, this is not the, the, the more popular waterfall just because there's one where people sort of have an overlook and you're looking kind of straight to the waterfall. That's usually where everybody goes, but this one is a little bit... Like it, it because it's a challenge to kind of get to is why you know it's I, I would say it's a little bit lesser known. Definitely, definitely. And uh, by the way, uh, you you've been talking about that you sell pictures, you uh, sell also education products online, presets and other stuff. You have a YouTube channel. Do you take people out there shoot in a private workshop in workshops uh, too? For things like this. I have not. Um, I've considered it, just like uh, I'm sort of mm -hmm. considering doing a, a, a workshop in Hawaii next year uh, because oh. it's it's something that is not it's not challenging because of the locations that I went to they're they're not treacherous or anything to really access. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas some of the places that I've done, you really have to be a skilled. Yeah not only a skilled photographer, but a skilled hiker. And I, my business partner and I, we've been hiking for years. And I mean, case in point, we had a friend that came on one of our hiking trips earlier this year. And I mentioned that he, he slipped right at the beginning. And, and so things like that are, you know, and taking someone that we knew, you know, it kind of shows us, okay, we have to be mindful of things like this. When we, so it's like a liability of, of all of that and putting all yeah. that together. It's it's a lot. Uh, whereas it's easier to teach something like uh, Hawaii or the workshops that I've done in New York City, just because I don't have that that sort of element. Uh, because a lot of the places I like going, or that my business partner and I like going to, are places that aren't always easily accessible because we want those more unique images. But with that comes the the risk factor, because I mean we have been in some really complex situations that it's like yeah. in hindsight it's like 
I can't believe we did that. We really are nuts. But I mean, when we come away with it, we have images that are like, how did you get that? Where is this? And things like that. And that's what we want. And mm -hmm. so, and, and that's why when I sell my images, I'm, I'm selective as far as what images I sell and what sort of tier, because there are certain, there are different tiers that I sell certain images, mm -hmm. depending on how the, the accessibility of certain images, they might be priced higher. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I think every image that I have on my wall are images that I sell. Uh, where like this image back behind me right now of the vessel, that's an image no one can ever take again because that place is now closed. <laughs> or an image like this one over here where, you know, it's an image that most people hadn't taken. And, you know, it's hard to replicate something like that. Or the images from the helicopters, you know, those, those are very specific images that not everybody is going to, to obtain. <laughs> and so that's how I sort of map out my cityscapes and landscapes. I want something that when you see it, you hadn't seen that composition before, or it's something that's so creative of a iconic location that it makes people think harder as far as when they go, as far as what kind of composition they come away with. <laughs> Have you considered to, to go into the NFT world or are you already in NFTs or? So popular I, nowadays. <laughs> I have I have no knowledge about it. I have not had yeah. time to look into it. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm always open to, to new stuff because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm always open-minded, but I just, no one has ever said, oh, let me tell you about this and what it can do and all that. I'm like, I'm always willing to listen, but I, I personally have had the time to sit down and look into that and as far as what it is and what it does or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, I see in the chat a few questions on, on the people are just, they want to learn more about editing uh, images with you. Uh, where do they can go to, to learn from you more um, editing and maybe get your presets? So in being, um, I, I, I do a lot of work with the Lightroom team. Um, as many people can go online and, and find my tutorial videos on my YouTube channel, Professor Hunt's Choice, which I'll go back to that last screen so people can see that again. Mm -hmm. uh, they can go to Professor Hunt's Choice, uh, where I, I take a lot of images that people comment about. So a lot of images in this presentation will actually be full length tutorials that I'll show and how I go through, especially utilizing the new features of Lightroom such as this year with the new masking tools. I have videos on that, as well as color grading. Um, I also have a, a Adobe Max session where I was teaching about color grading with color adjustments um, in Lightroom. That's the cloud-based version, but everything that you see can be applied to Lightroom Classic. It doesn't matter which one you're using, Lightroom Classic, Lightroom Web, Lightroom Mobile, all of it's the same. You can use the, the same functions there. Um, if people need more um, in-depth teaching than what the videos do. And I have had some people where they've been with me for several sessions, like even just down to the very beginning, how do I sort my images to get them into Lightroom? Like how do I, I you know, have a, a catalog that makes sense for my workflow? I will sit down with people individually if they want in, in um, paid workshops that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, where they can, you know, it, it's sort of basically where people can dictate how their workshop goes. You know, there's, I have a, a sort of curriculum that I'll follow, but I want people to get out of, out of it what they need to learn. Um, I can pretty much teach any genre as, as I am a multidiscipline photographer. So I've done weddings, I'm retired from weddings and portraits and events now but I still teach it. So it doesn't matter what the genre is, uh, or what people are trying to edit. I can do that, but what is it that they want most is how I like people to tell me so that way I can better teach them. Because I do know there are people who are on different levels as far as utilizing Lightroom, as there's so many features and it just gets better and better each year. You know, last year we had color grading introduced, this year we have the new masking tools and, even before then, people still wasn't utilizing it to its full potential and being able to pull and push certain things out of their images. So if people want that individual time, 
they can do that. And it's not listed on my website right now because I'm, I'm revamping that for 2022. Uh, but they will be back as far as the, the one-on-one Lightroom sessions mm -hmm. uh, where I'm, I'm strictly teaching Lightroom. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do have videos that show work in Photoshop, but I do not teach Photoshop on its own. I do not teach that by itself, no. Uh, I just feel like I'm more fluent in, in Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw. So that's why I just stick to those because I feel like just that alone, it's so much information that I, I want people to, to just get this one program first. Um, so yeah, it, there's many ways. And, and then two, if you utilize Lightroom, they, we, there's interactive tutorials in the cloud-based version. So if you're on your phone, even if you're on your desktop, if you go into the Lightroom app, there's a, a discover and learn tab that you can actually visit my profile and see interactive uh, sort of tutorials of my images. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I might cool. try to pull that up really quickly and uh, show how that, that does in, in Lightroom. So if you're someone that uses one or the other, you know, you can still choose to do that or you can have them both. You can sync them together. Um, and that's how I utilize them. But you'll see there's this learn tab where you can actually choose these interactive tutorials. And then there's also a discover tab where you can actually share your own images with the Lightroom community. You know, if you have an edit that you want to share, you can actually do that from the, the mobile app on your phone or here on the desktop. And so my profile here, you know, you can see my various images when they populate uh, of images. These are my discover feed. And these are my interactive tutorials. So if you click on them, you'll actually be able to start an interactive tutorial and see, walk through um, how I go through all of my wow. edits. And it, it tells you like, what am I doing? I, I have uh, typed all of this information in so that way people can understand how I go about editing these photos. Wow, oh, you're so cool. And uh, same with this, like this image that um, I was just showing you all, you actually can go into the Lightroom app now and see how that full image was edited. And by hitting the play, it'll go through interactively of all of these adjustments. So that way you can see what was done and follow along. That's super interesting. So cool, man. So, Thank there's, you for so there's many ways people can learn Lightroom, but um, definitely if you uh, send me an email, if you're wanting to take a one-on-one -on -one and learn more beyond all of the free material that I have online, that that's mm -hmm. uh, something I definitely welcome. What's your email address? Or I'm just telling people to go to Instagram and, and chat with you on Instagram. What's the easiest? Um, they can either do Instagram or my website, professorhines.com. My email is the awesome. same, professorhines at hotmail.com. I try to make everything easy for everyone. So anywhere online, I'm Professor Hines. So it's very simple <laughs> to find me. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. It's been uh, amazing to have you on the show and I hope people in the uh, we still have 152 people brave people uh, with us almost two hours <laughs> wow. uh, live uh, any last words before we say goodbye um I don't know any, I just would any say piece of advice like, hey, to spy I, people or something I would just tell people to continue shooting um, I've had where there are people who have been dis discouraged by people who, you know, may say comments to them, uh, oh, yeah. talking about their work. And I, I mean, as far as where I am in my career now, I still have people that will say negative comments. I don't care about negative comments. I really don't. I'm, I'm here. They're not. And it's about what you love most. If you like what you're doing, then you're doing the right thing. If you're just doing it to please others or you're doing it just just for the gram or, or anything um, other than yourself, it's it's not worth doing. And but you need to love what you do. And if you love what you do, you're doing the right thing. And no one else's comments and opinions matter. And I feel a lot of photographers, especially in this day and age with social media, they 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 sort of allow social media to consume them. Mm -hmm. And even when they're out in, in the elements, 
they they allow social media to control what they do and what they don't do. Whereas I can go on a trip. If I didn't, if I didn't have to touch my phone, I would be perfectly fine with that. And that's how some people should apply. And I, I think it's easier for me because my career started before social media. So my professional career is was 13 years ago, but I've been doing photography for 21 years. And I started in an age where I didn't have that. So I had to be outside. I had to enjoy the moment. Photography for me started for memories and it still does today. Mm -hmm. I just happened to share those memories with the community. That's how I, I position it. It's never about, yes, I work with all these companies. They want me to share pictures, taken with their products. Yeah, 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 we get it. But the thing of the companies that I'm with is that I'm very adamant about, I don't push gear that to where I, I seem like I'm an advertisement and that's yeah. not what I do. I'm someone who enjoys the art of photography, but these are the tools that I've been using for years. I'm fortunate enough to have these companies that I've been using for years represent me. This is how I get what I do. I mean, I don't ever encourage anyone to, to utilize the same gear that I have. Know what you're doing. It, you, it might not require you using Zeiss lenses or a Sony camera. Who knows? You need to mm -hmm. use what's best for you. You, a lot of people focus on settings. I, I get asked constantly about settings. I, I, I'm sure I probably get a lot of hate mail for this too. Don't care. <laughs> but if you have to shoot in full automatic, shoot in full automatic. Some photographers may say, oh, you don't want to do. If you don't really understand settings and you're asking about settings, shoot an automatic because then you'll get an idea for what the camera is deciding. Oh, this is what we feel is best for this particular scene. So that way you have something to kind of practice and study and say, oh, OK, now I have a, a mental uh, uh, visual of what this scene was and what the camera did. So when I go in and I'm in a similar situation, I can dial this in myself. And this, the same goes to, you know, people think I'm crazy for using manual lenses. But I always flip the question back because I, I, don't, I don't care what other people are using, but for some reason, others care what you use. I don't know why that is. I always ask the question, Anyone who says something about me using manual lenses, I flip it back and say, okay, what, what settings do you use on your camera? Nine out of 10 times, they shoot manual. Okay, so you're using manual settings with an autofocus lens. Isn't that the same situation? People don't think of that, that way. If you like all manual, why are your lenses not manual? That would make sense. If you say full manual, that's full manual. Not using manual settings in an autofocus lens. So what's what's to say that me using aperture priority and manual lenses isn't the same thing? <laughs> so people have to sometimes think about that. So people might try to make you feel small with their own ignorance, but yeah. don't feed into that. I've never fed into that. If anything, I use it for an advantage. There is a photographer that told me 12 years ago that I would never make it as a photographer because I'm not creative. Look at where I am today. Yeah, I, I was upset about that, but I didn't let it consume me. I mm -hmm. use it as positive energy and look at where I am. I love what I do. I don't care if anyone else doesn't. I'm fortunate that I have companies that also love my work. Mm -hmm. There are some companies that might not, that I've never heard from. Who cares? I don't do this for that reason. I do it because I just love the art and I love teaching. So those are my final words. I'm, I'm you know, I, I hope people value the art of photography and what it is and enjoy it, you know, create beautiful art and continue to share. That's the thing that we don't have a lot in this world, and especially with this being here with Thanksgiving, be willing to give. And of what you learn, of things that you've learned in this presentation, as you take this back and you take things that I've said to, to help you and then you start getting better, turn around and do the same thing. It should never end with you. It should always be an ongoing train to where you're teaching others as well. And so that's what I've always lived by and I hope others do the same and continue to 
let the art continue so that way others continue to prosper and, and people just continue to create beautiful art. Definitely a beautiful, beautiful words, man. Thank you for saying those words. Sharing is key, and we are truly believers in uh, in sharing everything we we know. Do not create secrets because we all need to evolve and we learn, you know, from each other all the time. So definitely. And I don't feel like there's any secrets to what I do. I mean, yeah, I yeah. I will hold someone's <laughs> hand and say, okay, this is what I'm using, or because yeah, I I yeah. mean, we, we're gonna see things differently, and that's the beauty of it. I'm like, we're, we're there to learn from one another. You know, mm -hmm. I'm still learning. I never feel like I've, I'm to a point to where I stop learning. There are people yeah. who, um, you know, as I'm getting older, there are people that are coming that are younger. And so I'm learning from them different things wow. and trying new things. Yeah. And so I'm always remastering and refining myself. So I, you know, people feel that at a certain point, they can't learn anything from others and they... They're the God of all gods and that yeah. they know everything. I never try to present myself that way. I just try to provide as much useful material as I can. You know, mm -hmm. in two hours, for some people, this is probably a lot to, to, to really digest. Yeah. But I just like sharing as much as I can. So that way people just get better in photography, understand photography more understand the inner workings of like what I do and really, you know, just have an understanding for my work and, and my love for what I do. Awesome, man. Thank you so much again for being here today with us. It's been uh, amazing. And yeah, it's time to say goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. You know, as always, if you like this video, give us a like, subscribe, and I'll see you next Wednesday in another video. And remember that you have the power to imagine, plan, and shoot legendary photos. Bye-bye, and thank you so much for watching. See you.